Doctor, uh, welcome everyone. We are very pleased to have Dr. John Sara from uh, Los Alamos National Lab. He's a deputy director of uh, LANL uh, for the science, technology, and engineering. That's sort of the he has this one point six billion dollar organization with uh, uh, you know almost four thousand employees with extensive science, technology, and engineering that's driving the. Uh, national security mission at uh, Los Alamos. Dr. Sarao has a PhD from UCLA in condensed matter physics. Yeah, he's a physicist. Uh, um, and uh, he has had a long and distinguished career in research and leadership positions. Um, he has a APS fellow, AAS fellow, and recently 2013 DOE Lawrence Award uh, for the discovery and study of new materials especially those based on plutonium and for advancing the understanding of unconventional magnetic and superconducting states and strongly correlated condensed matter systems. Um, he's going to talk about opportunity, carrier opportunities in national labs in general and Los Alamos in particular. And this should be uh, uh, an extremely useful talk for those looking for opportunities uh, in the national labs. Thanks, John. Please take over. Great. Thanks, Rupak. Thanks for the introduction. I'm glad to be joining you. Wish I were to call it station. Um, someday soon, I'm sure we'll make that happen, but delighted to do that from afar today. Um, in that spirit, um, if you have questions as we go, feel free to include that in the chat, and I'll try to either answer them at the end or sort of in situ if that makes sense. Um, as, as Rupak foreshadowed, I, I guess there's two things I want to accomplish today. Um, Rather than talking about my own personal research, which I'd be delighted to do, but that's probably not what you came to hear about, um, I wanted to talk about pipeline in two themes. Um, one, the pipeline of people, i.e. the fact that Los Alamos and all the national laboratories were pretty proactively growing in hiring. So I want to talk about those specific opportunities. Um, but I think even more importantly, talk about the pipeline of ideas, the things that are important to us from an st &E strategy perspective and where we might do more things together between the laboratory and Texas A&M. So, so that will be sort of the theme for the discussion um, as we go through. Um, so, so Rupak started with a very nice sort of formal introduction, which I appreciate. Um, this is a bit more of the sort of honest um, introduction of context for the laboratory. So um, I'll, I'll start with a bit of a story. Um, so when I was in graduate school, I thought I was being a proactive graduate student because um, I started working for a professor in the spring of my first year, hoping that I'd have somebody pay the bills for me in the summer of my first year. That seemed like a good and positive outcome. Um, and, and this faculty member who ended up being my thesis advisor and we still have a great relationship today, um, he had vaguely mentioned this Los Alamos thing to me. And I kind of knew Los Alamos was somewhere in New Mexico. I knew something about the Manhattan Project. Um, and that was about it. And then one day during finals of spring quarter, um, he literally came into the room where I was taking a final, tapped me on the shoulder and said, John, come to my office when your test is done. Well, so at that point, I actually respected authority. So my test was kind of done right at that point. I uh, went up to see him and he said, well, you know, John, you seem like a pretty decent guy. The project you're working on seems okay, but I don't have any money. You know, would you be interested in going out to Los Alamos for the summer? And I said, well, sure. I was where I placed my first month if possible. Um, you know, when would I start? And so it turns out this was a Thursday. And if he said, well, if you could be there by Monday, that'd be great. Um, so, so my introduction to the laboratory was sort of a zero notice, throw my stuff in the car and drive out to Los Alamos. Um, and in some sense, as the rest of this chronology um, describes, um, the rest is history. So, so part of this conversation is the recognition that, you know, although we at the lab think, you know, we know what we're doing and across all of you, we think the labs are important crown jewels of the nation. Um, large parts of the research community don't know us very well. So, so part of the goal of this discussion is to broaden that conversation and give you an awareness of the opportunities that exist. Um, for myself, it, it worked out that first summer, I went back to UCLA for my second year of grad school and finished my classes. And then I essentially spent all of grad school at the lab. And I frankly know my colleagues at the lab better than I know my colleagues at what was UCLA at the time. So. Um, that sort of is the sort of the entry point. Um, as the bottom half of the slide says, um, I've been at the lab now for a pretty long time um, in a variety of roles from, from doing you know, real research um, to thinking I was doing research to now mostly playing the leadership role where 
if I actually walk into the lab, especially my own lab, um, the, the people who run them now are smart enough not let me do real work. So that hopefully gives you a context um, for the discussion we'll have um, over the course of the day. Um, I guess the next point I want to make, and this is sort of you know an attention getting slide, um, these numbers are specific to Los Alamos, um, but are relatively representative of all the labs. So at Los Alamos, we're actively growing. Um, and we're relatively old. So on the left half of the slide, you can see the red numbers. Those are the people that are attributing from the laboratory, mostly due to retirement. Um, the so golden bars are how many we've hired. So in any typical year, we're hiring between 1,000 and 1,200 odd people um, so that we're growing at a net of about 500 a year. Um, I would say importantly, in the current context, that growth is continuing even through COVID. So well, I, I certainly you know watch with pain and sympathy the struggles that a number of the universities are facing um, as they try to manage through the pandemic. We don't have that problem. So numbers were only mid-year numbers for 20, but in fact, by the end of September when our fiscal year ended, we had hired almost 1,200 people. So so our growth is continuing, and there's a growing cohort of our staff who only know us through the virtual existence of the pandemic. Um, the other part of that which makes this discussion important is I'm showing you on the upper right the number of students and postdocs we have. Um, and so something like two-thirds of our staff, like me, myself, I did just described in the previous slide, came to the laboratory as a student or a postdoc. So in a typical summer, we had about, we have about 1,800 students in the laboratory, um, and today we're over 500 postdocs. Our students and postdocs are so important to us um, that even in spite of the pandemic this past summer, when obviously it would have been crazy to try to bring 1,800 students um, to northern New Mexico, we adapted our student program to a virtual program and had more than 1,000 students um, you know, as our employees working mostly remotely in a variety of settings. Um, and that's actually worked so well. We've continued our virtual student program. So there's something like 300 students who are at various campuses around the country and around the world working for us part-time while they're also going to classes. So, so students and postdocs are a big driver of our future workforce. Um, and part of that, why that's important, is the last bottom third right of the slide. Um, we have some work to do in being you know, as diverse as we need to be as being a, a laboratory that looks like our research community. Um, the good news is our postdoc diversity is more diverse than our general lab population. And so as long as we do right in student and postdocs and we continue to hire from them, we'll make progress overall. Um, that's not nearly enough to achieve the diverse and inclusive culture we're after, but it certainly is a key step. And if we get that wrong, then certainly I'll hope it's lost. So, so that's a bit of my introduction, both my personal story and why conversations like this relative to career opportunities are so important. Um, to broaden the conversation before I go to the laboratories, and I was Glad to see my, my good friend, Bob Tribble, who's also, also one of you and a, and a colleague of all of yours on the, on the Zoom call, because um, Bob and I had this conversation this morning. You know, let's make sure we talk about all the labs, not just Los Alamos, and that's, I completely agree with that. Um, so what I'm showing you here is actually a representation um, that the 17 DOE labs created. So, so it turns out the Department of Energy has 17 labs. Their logos are shown here. Um, you can imagine that if you get 17 directors of labs together and say, we want to draw a universal picture that represents all of us, um, that's a complicated process with lots of bickering and lots of politics. But, but this is the result, um, and, and there's several things you can take away from this. Um, one, Bob's laboratory, Bob has the same job at Brookhaven that I have at Los Alamos, is on the far left. Um, Los Alamos is sort of a third up on the right. And in the outer ring are those laboratories that are characteristically big um, and also characteristically multi-program. They do a variety of different things, um, spanning from the most fundamental science on the left um, to the mo more national security centric on the right. Um, and in fact, the three biggest labs are Sandia, Los Alamos, and Lithuania. Um, and the inner part of the circle are those labs that are characteristically smaller um, and also have a more narrow focus. So for example, Fermi Lab really is the high energy physics laboratory. Um, Day Lab plays a key role for nuclear physics. Um, the Princeton Plaza Physics Laboratory is exactly what its name says. 
um, Ames is material centric and so on. And so, you know, in addition to this conversation, I would certainly urge any and all of you to reach out to any of these laboratories and certainly folks like myself and Bob Tribble would be happy to make those connections for all of you because, well, I'm going to focus most of my remarks on Los Alamos. I really do think there's an opportunity across the DOE labs that really is an unsung opportunity. Um, if you're looking especially for something that's in between academia and industry. So, so there's a broad opportunity and each of these 17 labs um, has their own story to tell. You can plot that same data in a different way. Um, so here's sort of is the geographic cut. And, and I probably should have annotated this map of the country with College Station right in the appropriate place. Um, but all of you know where you are. Um, and you know that at least for we at Los Alamos, we're one of the closest labs to all of you. Um, and that's one of the relationships we have, in addition to the fact that Texas A&M plays an essential role in the current management of Los Alamos um, through this entity we call Triad. Um, so the, the point here is to show you the geographic distribution of labs and also just a sense of scale. So, so the labs really are a pretty large enterprise going on 70,000 total employees and a goodly fraction, more than a third, are technical research staff. And, and all of the labs, just like Los Alamos, rely on postdocs and students in a significant way. And so whether you come to one of the national laboratories for essentially your entire life, as I did, or whether you just spend a short virtual summer with you, with us, I would encourage all of you to think about this as, as a particular stop in your own career journey in that regard. Um, so those are the comments I wanted to make about labs in general. I'll pivot now to Los Alamos in specific, but certainly at the end, happy to answer any kinds of questions that folks have about lab opportunities um, writ large across the entire 17 labs um, that the Department of Energy has. Um, so if we now pivot to Los Alamos, um, this is a slide that we tend to show our visitors um, because it tends to represent our complexity. So, so one measure of our complexity is we're awfully big. So one measure of our geographic bigness is we've got something like 40 square miles. So when, we, when visitors from Washington, D.C. come to visit, visit us, we inscribe a map of the District of Columbia on this and show that we're about the same size. Apologies for the phone in the background. That'll stop in a second. Um, we're also distributed across a set of technical areas, which are shown on this map. Um, because of some of what we do, um, we like the fact that we're relatively isolated because we can do stuff off in back corners where other people don't notice. Um, we've got a lot of buildings. Um, unfortunately, you know, the, the building count on this slide says 1,280. Um, if, I, if you ask me the question, how many of those buildings are new and modern um, and built, for example, in the century, um, it's probably a number that's much less than 10%. So we're also a relatively old campus dating to our Manhattan Project roots. And that's a trend that DOE shares. Um, so lots of other facts and figures about people and budgets and directorates and divisions. And I'd be happy to talk about any of those things as we go along. Um, but I think that's frankly more trouble than it's worth. And it's part of what makes, I think, the labs not as accessible as they could be. So what I want to do is sort of describe to you the laboratory, not in this geographic sense, um, but in sort of two ways that hopefully give you some context. So the first of those is the one I like least, but it's kind of necessary. So because we're a big lab of about 13,000 people and a budget of about $3 billion, of course, we have an organizational structure, and that's what I'm showing you here. So um, our lab director now going on two years is Tom Mason. Um, Tom is also a physicist, so we are a physics-centric laboratory at the moment. Um, Tom was previously the director of Oak Ridge for about a decade um, and came to Los Alamos two years ago. We've structured the laboratory into three deputy directorates, um, myself and STA, uh, my colleague Bob Webster, who many of you at Texas A&M also know, um, and then Kelly Byersman in operations. Um, I won't talk about the structure in any detail, because again, I don't think it's the best way to think about the laboratory, but certainly for those of you who want to make connections, connecting through various line organizations can be a useful approach um, and at least in the, in the ALDs in my part of the laboratory, um, the names are relatively intuitive. So for this physics audience, yes, so many of you have colleagues, have collaborations, would have research opportunities, for example, in our physical sciences organization. But part of the theme of this discussion is the opportunities are actually much bigger and much broader than that. Um, the other point that I'll make is in addition to being home of four directorates, uh, the same four directors as the previous slide, 
now in this baby blue color. One of the things that the laboratory does, and it will be the focus of my remarks, is my part of the laboratory has the responsibility to steward our R&D capabilities. So lots of the things that include how we invest internally with a thing called LDRD, um, how we define strategy and integration, which I'll talk about, and especially everything we do in partnerships and pipelines as led by my colleague, Nan Sauer, including this, this function called the National Education Center, which I'll touch on at the end, as well as our student postdoc programs, all of that really flows through my part of the laboratory. So, so discussions like this really are quite natural because many of my organizations and many of my functional mechanisms are the entry points to the laboratory for people who come to the laboratory in science, technology, engineering, and end up either staying for their entire life doing very fundamental, very basic, very open research, um, or migrate to other parts of the laboratory. So, so that's context. Um, but again, I don't think org structure is really the right way to think about the laboratory. So where I'm going to spend the rest of my time is talking about lab strategy, because strategy really is the way to think about what we do, um, at least in my, in, in my context. Um, and I want to do that in three specific contexts. So I want to talk about mission. I want to talk about things we call capability pillars. And then I want to thirdly talk about something we call the laboratory agent. And all three of things start with this picture here. So, so our top line laboratory strategy is something we call simultaneous excellence. Um, and simultaneous excellence means all we have to do to be successful is do four things. And if we can do those four things all at the same time, um, we're getting the job done. Now, that's obviously easier said than done, um, but I think keeping it sort of simple is an important way of making sure we're focused. So, so what are those four things that we have to do well? Um, firstly, we have to be excellent in nuclear security. So, so we exist as a national nuclear security laboratory. We have ours as the birthplace of the Manhattan Project. And as we'll talk about more in just a moment, we play an essential role in security in the U.S. as a nuclear deterrent. Um, in addition to doing that, which is very mission-driven and, and sort of problem pull centric um, we also have to be excellent in broad spaces in science, technology, and engineering, anticipating the, un, the unknown unknowns, you know, being good at areas before they become important. Um, we've had an effort in biology for a very long time. You know, up until the past year, people would ask the question, you know, why do you care about biology? What's so important about epidemiology? I think our expertise there has been validated in our current challenges. So, so element one of the strategy really is how do we balance the mission pull, the near-term delivery of excellence in nuclear security with the capability push of unknown, unknown science, technology, and engineering. We spend a lot of time getting that balance right between those two things. And that's part of what makes us unique and different um, than say an academic department. And so we'll talk quite a bit about that, that tension, which I think is quite constructive and quite positive but it's important to manage during the rest of this conversation. But that's only two out of four things. Um, the other two things we have to do well is one, we have to be excellent in operations. Now, part of that's intuitive because you know, we at Los Alamos in particular, and I think all of us in general, if you're not excellent in operations, if you don't follow your own rules, if you have safety upsets and security upsets, you get yourself in trouble and you lose the ability to do what you want to do, which is arguably the first two circles. Um, that's true. Um, part of our strategy is to make excellence in mission operations not a reactive, not a negative thing, but rather a proactive, positive opportunity. When we're good in, excellent, when we're good in mission operations, we can do some really cool, really dangerous, really scary stuff that nobody can do. So a lot of the work we do in our very remote geography is driven by the excellent mission operations and lets us take on a problem that nobody else can solve. So the strategic part of that is making that proactive, not reactive. Um, and then fourthly, we have to be a good neighbor. Um, the, the pros here highlights being a good neighbor in our northern New Mexico region. Um, and that's certainly important because if our, if our neighbors don't appreciate the value we provide, then especially when something bad happens, they're not going to be very receptive. Um, but especially for my part of the laboratory, Excellence in community relations extends exactly to conversations like today. 
we need to be a good partner. We need to have collaborators across the country, across the world, because we certainly don't have a premium on high quality science, technology, engineering. So everything we do in partnerships and everything we do in pipeline space very much flows through excellence community relations. So, so those four things are simultaneous excellence, and that is our top line strategy for the laboratory. We've taken that one step farther in the last year um, and also identified something we call the laboratory culture statement. And that statement is how we do our work is as important as what we do. Um, it's frankly the case that in our history, um, we've had some of our folks who do really important, really essential, really cool stuff. And unfortunately, they said, because my work is important, how I get it done doesn't matter so much. I can, I can trample on people's feelings. I can treat people not so good. Um, that's clearly unacceptable. So, so my, my paraphrasing of how we do our work is as important as what we do is that we're not interested in heroic jerks. Um, that really, you know, if we're gonna do our job right, we not only have to do our important work well, but we have to treat our people well as well. And that includes creating the right inclusive culture that causes us to be successful. Those two things really go hand in hand. Um, and in fact, I could just stop at this point and say, I described the last strategy, I'm done, thank you very much. Um, realistically, that's probably not detailed enough for all of you who wanna form relationships with us. So I'm gonna talk about this in greater detail as we keep going, but I wanted to keep this high level framing in mind because it really is central to how we think about things. So I told you wanna talk about this in three chapters. Um, so let's first talk about this in the context of mission. Um, so I already noted that you know, from, from our beginning and continuing today, our core mission is to ensure the safety, security, and reliability of the US's nuclear deterrent. Uh, the most important thing our lab director does every year is he writes a letter to the president that either our nuclear stockpile is safe, secure, and reliable, or it's not. And, and you know, Tom, who's been a lab director for a long time, you know, even he says it, it was pretty sobering the first time you signed that letter, because uh, that really is the core of what we do. Um, that's especially true because we've been doing that now for more than 20 years without doing nuclear testing. So it really is a validation of our, our science, technology, engineering capability that we can say we'll have confidence that if called upon, the stockpile will work um, without actually testing it in its use condition. So it's both an important st &E challenge, and I think it also goes to sort of deterrence and, and frankly global peace in general, that that confidence says it doesn't have to be actively used. Um, our footprint in that space is large, so it turns out that, that the U.S. stockpile is made up of seven different systems, um, four of which we steward, um, and that's something like 70 odd percent if you actually count the individual um, weapons and devices. Um, so if I were to ask, you know, did you know Los Alamos did that? I think most people would say yes. Some of people would be dates to Manhattan Project, and that goes to weapons physics and weapons design. And that's absolutely true. And a number of the strengths of the physics department at Texas A&M line up very nicely with that. It's also the case, though, that in addition to physics design, there's a large role in engineering and also a growing role in production. So, so our nuclear weapons mission is not just physics design, but also engineering and production. And, and the kind of pictures I'm showing you on the right of the slide are both the modeling and simulation and experimental tools that cause that to happen. And so it's, it's the, the need to be excellent in those areas of science and give us confidence in the stockpile that let us be a bigger and better st and &E organization. If you take that though one step further, so I just described to you the part of our mission that's in the upper left, and, and relatively speaking, we're unique in that space. Um, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California has a similar mission, but we really are the only two games in town, at least in the United States, in that space. For better or for worse, um, being excellent nuclear security doesn't get it done, because frankly, the world is a scary place, and there's more to national security uh, than just having a So that picks up the lower left of our mission space. Um, that which we do in non-proliferation, working with other people who are motivated to do the right thing, who we can partner constructively with. Also, counter pollution, where we can make sure people who don't want to do the right thing are kept from doing that. So, so our new mission, both is our own U.S. deterrent, 
but also the global role we play in nuclear non-proliferation and nuclear counter-proliferation. Um, however, and again, as we're seeing in the current pandemic, which, which is clearly a public health challenge, but could just as easily be a bio-threat challenge, there's more to national security than just nuclear. And so we call that cross-domain deterrence. Um, those are the set of challenges that include bio-threats and chem threats and cyber threats, all of which are grounded in national security. And that extends all the way to energy security, because energy clearly is a national security challenge in the context of these questions. And so, yes, we're very active in energy security, um, and we have an energy strategy that includes the three shown on the right. Um, one is a substantial focus on energy, the other is a focus on resilient materials, and the third is a focus on complex energy systems. And so, our mission spans all the way from the upper left, where we're relatively unique, um, to frankly the lower right, where we believe we have an important role to play. It's very broad, but we're also not unique. And so a big part of the challenge is making sure we understand where our special and unique contributions are, um, and that's why partnering is so important. And so wherever you find yourself across this continuum of mission needs, all of this lives in the space of how we do our national security mission. And so I think it's important to think about the broad set of challenges we're focused on, not just our own nuclear deterrent, as important as that is. So that's the context that I wanted to set in terms of mission pull and what our national security drivers are. So that's chapter one of strategy. Um, but now turn to chapter two of strategy. Um, if you ask yourself the question, what areas of science, technology, and engineering do you have to be a leader in if you want to deliver on the missions we just described? Um, our answer is shown here. Um, it turns out we call these things capability pillars, um, and we actually manage ourselves and our st &E base through these capability pillars. Um, I'm gonna talk through each one of these in detail from materials to nuclear and particle futures to is &T, to science and signatures, to weapon systems and complex engine systems. Um, I guess the takeaway I would encourage you to take from this level is, um, you know, firstly, hopefully some of these choices are intuitive, that you say, yes, given, given the mission set I just described to you, that being good at materials and certainly condensed matter physics has a role to play there is important. Um, that nuclear particle futures is all over the things you said. So, so physicists in general and all of you as a, as a distinguished physics department should certainly see yourself in this space. And on the other hand, this is not the traditional academic structure. So very few universities have departments named any of these six things. And so that's part of what makes our st &E enterprise different, um, and we think hopefully special and unique. Um, the other point that I'll make before I start walking through these in detail is, um, until as recently as two years ago, um, we only had four pillars. And so the four pillars are the three on the left, materials, nuclear and particle futures, and information science technology, as well as science and signatures. And, and when the lab's management changed two years ago and Texas A&M joined our partnership, we asked ourselves the question, is this the right answer or are we missing something? And we convinced ourselves we were missing something. And the thing that we were missing was the two on the right, the first of which is weapon systems, and the second is complex natural engine systems. Again, I'll describe them both in a second, but the thing I would want you to think about as I talk is I really think the accent in both of those is on systems. The need to integrate interdisciplinary thinking really is central to what we do. Um, so those are our six pillars. Um, again, you know, probably useful topics. Um, I think hopefully some of you see yourselves in them, but also still probably a bit too high level to really know where to make content. So let's talk about our strategy in each of these six areas. Um, so, firstly, in materials. Um, so, at the highest level, our goal in materials research is to both be able to predict materials performance, um, often in a rather extreme set of circumstances, and also to control functionality. And so, again, there's a push and a pull in that space. Um, I think anybody who thinks about materials probably has a goal that's somewhat synonymous to performance prediction and controlled functionality. And so, that's probably not enough. And so, we've then subsequently defined three science themes. Um, 
the importance of defects and interfaces, that useful materials are not perfect and homogeneous and pristine. Uh, they're actually defects because that makes them useful and valuable. Uh, that we ask our materials to perform in relatively extreme environments, which makes it more challenging than, for example, having pure, co pure copper on a laboratory bench. Um, and especially in the domain of condensed matter physics, um, the area of emergent phenomena. Um, and the fact that, for example, um, plutonium, although, you know, in addition to being very useful for our mainline product, um, actually gives rise to what is rather high temperature superconductivity is not just a coincidence, it actually directly derives from that. So, so those themes help add specificity to our overall materials goal. And then at the bottom are seven specific areas of leadership um, where we think we need to be good at and either are leaders or are aspiring to be leaders. So I won't talk about each of those seven areas of leadership here, but towards the end in Q&A, if anybody wants to ask questions about any of those seven, I would be delighted to go into even more depth. Similarly, in the area of nuclear and particle futures, um, we've identified four areas where we think we have to lead. So, so most fundamentally, is nuclear particle astrophysics and cosmology, so that's impact. That, that really is the part of NTF that is the most academic, that relies heavily on the Department of Energy's Office of High Energy Physics, the Office of Nuclear Physics. Um, we're active at many of the other laboratories that you saw in the earlier slides. We have folks who are permanently stationed at Fermilab. We've done great work with Brookhaven and, and JLab and labs in the physics space. We're very collaborative. We're very open in that space. And in fact, a number of all of you at Texas A&M are our active partners in impact. Hand in hand with impact is ANSI, Applied Nuclear Science Engineering, which is both the part of the part of that synergy, which goes to the actual nuclear engineering of our stockpile, but also the actually significant and growing work we're doing in nuclear energy. So, so there's a very strong again push pull between impact and ANSI. And, and frankly, part of the reason this area exists as a pillar is to create that synergy. Because, you know, frankly, nobody went to graduate school, at least not in this country, to be a nuclear weapons designer. Many of them went to graduate school to be particle physicists or astrophysicists or cosmologists. And it turns out that skill set maps nicely. So many people come to the laboratory in the more open areas of this chart and contribute to our mission, either there for their whole careers or in other parts of the laboratory. Um, the same is true in the area of high energy plasmas and fluids. So this is sort of the area of HED, um, also areas of laser science, um, significant space in that regard, um, including the work we do both at the National Mission Facility at Lawrence Livermore, um, the Z machine at Sandia, and also the Omega Laser Facility at University of Rochester. And then finally, for all of these areas, both for science and technology and also for mission, um, accelerator is really our central. So at, La at Los Alamos, we have our Lance accelerator, um, which is a proton accelerator that uses either those protons or spallation derived neutrons to do a variety of materials physics, nuclear physics, isotope production, a variety of uses. And as I already noted, we also are active at a variety of facilities around the, lab around the world, uh, both the photon sources that are stewarded by a variety of office science laboratories and many other accelerators as well for a variety of impact. So, and this is probably, again, one of our more open areas in that regard and the synergy between the openness and community engagement and our mission drivers really is key to our NCF pillars. The third of the six capability areas is information science and technology. So as you'd expect, this is an area driven by our leadership in high performance computing and our important role in simulation. But again, as all of you know, that landscape is changing. So, so yes, we do continue to steward some of the world's very largest com um, computers and do some of the largest calculations on them. And a number of the elements of our code base uh, are actually being developed in partnership with folks at Texas a and But this is also a space that's evolving pretty rapidly. And so whether it's questions of data-driven discovery and how we find needles and haystacks in a variety of experiments, um, how we understand whether the data we have actually has high fidelity um, or not, um, and, and the emerging role of quantum computing, which plays a role not only in ISMT, but also in materials and NPF really is central. So this really is an area that's changing sort of rather remarkably and rather uh, aggressively 
what I'm showing you on the right are six different Office of Science reports, our different frontiers that both shape our strategy and which we look almost play a part in. Um, in speaking to an audience of physicists, um, one thing that's notable here is artificial intelligence doesn't overtly show up on this list. And so you can ask the question, you know, how can that be? Well, in fact, it is there in a bunch of the different areas. Um, but I think for us, the question becomes, you know, how do you play a role in a space, you know, where Google and, and Netflix and Amazon already know what you want to buy or eat or, or shop? You know, what's, what's the role of a national laboratory? Um, and for us, that role is pretty clear. It's an area we call physics and form machine learning, where, where there actually are laws of physics. And it's not just a question of pattern recognition, but that understanding of laws of physics derives your understanding is a niche both for we as a community of physicists um, and, we, and we at Los Alamos in particular that we're very focused on. So even an is and I think is a very significant um, role for physicists to play in that space. And then move on to the area of science of signatures. Um, the, the focus here really is on advanced measurements. So, so this gets to how do we think about can we detect chemical threats, bio threats, nuclear threats, and the more the easier we can detect them at lower concentrations at a distance, um, the better off we are because we can interject bad things early for the evolution. Um, but also, a lot of the work we do in climate modeling and aerosol monitoring and other kinds of environmental understanding is active in this space. And, and this is the first of the pillars where this overlay of system engineering becomes, comes to the fore and will continue to play out in the next two. So the challenge, of course, is not just understanding in a pristine laboratory how I can detect some signature, but also how do I invent, how do I discover some revolutionary measurement technique? And, and because many of these things are needles and haystacks, the measurement directly couples with the information science and technology on the previous slide. Um, and then finally, you have to deploy that. Um, and, and whether that's deploying that in relatively hostile environments where the other guy doesn't know you're there and doesn't want you there, uh, or whether it's things like an activity we embarked on over the past year with a number of our colleagues from other DOE laboratories and universities, um, purposely getting ourselves stuck on an icebreaker in the Arctic and measuring sort of, you know, uh, ice conditions and, and climate conditions where polar bears were the hostile threat. All of that lives in this space and the piece of deployment really is key in that regard. So those four pillars are pillars we've had for a while. And I just told you we added two more recently. Um, so the two we added more recently our, our weapon system, and again, here the accent is not on weapons, because in fact, all the pillars I already described to you um, very much contribute to our weapons mission, always have, always will, um, but here the focus is on the system part of that. So as good as you are at materials, as good as you are at physics, as good as you are at computing, um, there still is a piece of design that says, how do you bring those pieces together and I'm either design sort of on a blank sheet of paper your weapon systems, or how you reverse engineer other people's systems, there is something different about design. It's not just the sum of the previous parts. Um, the same is true of production and manufacturing. Yes, of course, manufacturing is a materials problem, but, but just being a great materials laboratory doesn't let you do production and manufacturing at scale and the various optimizations you have to have. Um, and then finally, in the area of systems analysis, whether it's reverse engineering other people's systems or trying to figure out from defects what went wrong, all of those things are above and beyond the areas we talked about. And that was the basis for creating this weapon systems pillar. And, and partly that was timely because, as you can see on the left half of the slide, as, as the country thinks about its overall stockpile posture, it's evolving pretty rapidly. So the, the current stockpile we have was one that was very much built in the Cold War where we optimized yield for weight. We frankly didn't worry about cost efficiency and, and speed wasn't really one of our sort of key things. This current situation is very different as, as shown on the right side of the column. And it's responding to these needs, which goes hand in hand with the area that was described to you. The same is true in this area of complex natural and engineered systems. Um, and so again, 
as the picture on the bottom right shows, it's an integration of capabilities that really is differentiating here. Um, I've already talked a bit about in these three challenge areas, the focus on nuclear threats and non-nuclear threats. So the thing that I'll highlight here is how we think about both engineered systems and natural systems when it comes to, to energy integration, when it comes to climate modeling, when it comes to sustainability impact. So all of that is very much hand in hand here. And, and one of the things that's remarkable is how closely coupled these sort of most open, most quote unquote green applications really are to our core nuclear weapons business. So for example, within the Department of Energy, we have sort of the oldest and longest standing fuel cell programs. So we've been doing fuel cells for more than 40 years. Um, that's obviously important to our renewable energy future, but those self same expertises play a key role um, in, our, in our nuclear mission as well. And that's just one of many examples in that space. So that brings me back to where I started. Sort of chapter two was, we think about how we lead in science, technology, engineering through these capability pillars, try to give you some flavor of what we do in these areas, the sense that they are long-term areas, that they're interdisciplinary, and this balance of mission pull and capability push really is central to what we do. So that's two out of three chapters on strategy. Um, let's turn to chapter three as we get closer to the end. And that's rel it's a relatively new thing for us, and that's something we call the lab agenda. So if your memory is good, um, you'll remember that I showed you four circles, and those four circles are the tops of these four columns. So again, we're being consistent with our strategy. And what this attempts to do is make actionable and specific the things we're doing in each of those four areas of excellence. And what I'm going to dwell on here a little bit is the bottom half of the slide, these major strategic initiatives. And so they're trying to define an in-between space in terms of timeliness, from the most urgent mission pulls, which are measured in years or less, to the decadal capability stewardship, here, the sweet spot is kind of in the one to five year time scale. One measure of that is, you know, this is the FY21 lab agenda. I think this is actually the first time we've shown this publicly because we just finished it last week. Uh, but in fact, if I used the old slide, the FY2120 lab agenda, it wouldn't have been any different. And in fact, the only differences are the two bullets in red shown at the bottom. So at this level, we only change two things because, again, we're on a several year time scale, not an urgent time scale. I also told you that all four columns of simultaneous excellence are important. Um, but what I want to do, both to focus this discussion and make it slightly more visible, is focus on the two leftmost columns. So here I'm showing you exactly the same slide, just blown up so you can actually see it. And what I'm highlighting here are various areas, highlighted in bold, which are areas of science, technology, and engineering that are, one, important to us, Two are similar to what we talked about in capability pillars, but also are three somewhat more actionable. So again, if you have particular interests, if you have particular expertises in any of these areas, this also creates another context in which to partner. And so whether it's aspects of how do we transform in a disruptive way in weapons design, how do we anticipate threats we either know or don't know and develop tools to be responsive, how we address key questions like stockpile aging the lifetime on the left, um, or on the right, um, overt emphases on accelerator S S um, science, engineering, and technology for reasons I described. Um, a focus on the frontiers of computing and this pivot from traditional HPC through exascale and beyond. Um, the overt play in quantum information that I mentioned to you that spanned a variety of our pillars, um, all important areas in that regard. Um, in 2.5 and 2.6, um, here are the real focus of the integration. Our challenge is this is a really interesting and important time for the future of nuclear energy. And we have an awful lot of work to do for our plutonium mission. How in those two areas we make the whole greater the sum of its parts and make our facilities responsive to both of those are key parts of the challenge. And then the one new one, which is now in black here, not red as in the previous slide, is this focus on national security life sciences. So for those of you who thought about bio threat and bio risk and pandemics, you know, you've known for a long time that's a challenge where we're nationally have not been responsive as it could be. Um, if the last year hasn't taught us we gotta get serious, I don't know what will. And so that's one of our foci this year to sort of redouble our own COVID efforts and move in that regard. 
Um, so, so again, that's chapter three of strategy. I gave you a mission context. I gave you a capability pillar context with most of my time there. Um, and then I talked about lab agenda as an intermediate space, hopefully all of which are mean to connect with us to form relationships. So to close, um, a couple quick slides to finish. Um, in the beginning, I talked about partnerships and pipeline. And I actually showed you in the fourth column that one of our goals this year is to sort of redouble our efforts in partnering. Um, two years ago, we created an office of partnerships and pipeline, what we call PPO. And all the things in this slide are there. One of the strengths it gives us is putting all those mechanisms all in one place says we have to be coherent because they're all working together. Whether that's our overt pipeline efforts, like our student programs and our postdoc programs, whether it's our various means of partnering, um, either with sort of the, the research community writ large, and on the next slide I'll talk about NSEC, the National Security Education Center, in greater detail, whether it's partnering with our overt New Mexico partners, or whether it's our industry engagement, all these things all live in one place to again create sort of a one-stop shop for partnering with the laboratory, which hopefully makes us more accessible and more open and transparent. So I alluded to NSEC, um, and I told you about um, the, the six capability pillars. So what I'm showing you in black are six centers, six national security education centers, and I'm giving you the title and their topical focus. So hopefully none of these areas are a surprise to you because they should sound exactly like the pillars, and that's on purpose. So although the mapping is not one for one, there's a focus in these centers on things that are important to us. And, and the purpose of these centers, as the top of the slide says, is to foster collaboration, is to foster education, and to foster recruitment. So for example, in the summers, we run a whole bunch of summer schools. So it's not just you as an individual person can come work with one of us in some partnership. We actually have schools on quantum, on cyber, on any number of things. Um, the, the insect centers host them. Uh, in addition, and I tried to find the closest thing I could to Texas a and Maroon, um, one of the new things we've kicked off just in the last couple of weeks um, is a joint center for resilient national security. Um, so this is an effort that's specifically between Texas A&M and us, focused on some of these questions of national security and resiliency that I alluded to in weapon systems and also in the mission description. So it, it's, a, it's a slightly different beast than the other six, but it's an overt measure of how we're trying to do more things together with the broader community, especially with all of you at Texas A&M. Um, Finally, I wanted to give you some specific names and contacts. Um, and again, on the Texas A&M side, certainly the National Laboratories Office has been a key partner for us. Um, and, and if you haven't met Diane Hurtado yet, I certainly encourage all of you to do that. Diane is a great entry point um, to the laboratory. And frankly, Diane could probably right now give this talk at least as well as I give it. Um, and and you know, please don't be shy. I'm happy to talk to any of you anytime, anywhere about any of these topics. Feel free to reach out by email, um, and I'll pause in just a second, and certainly happy to ask questions as well. So, so I'll finish with a final slide and then go back to the contact one. Um, so, you know, I've tried to give you a sense of, you know, we exist to do national security science, and this balance of simultaneous excellence, so trying to do four things right, is important to us, and at least for us feels different and complementary to the work that many of you do. So that means we, we have the prospect for, for being good partners. Um, we're trying to respond to key challenges, and we can only do that both with the right current and future workforce and the right set of partners to engage in, because we certainly don't have a monopoly and all the great ideas or all the great challenges. So, so that's why it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I appreciate all of you taking the time to listen. Um, I'll go back to contact information so you can scribble down names if you want. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you for your attention again, and be happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. And thank you for the virtual round of applause. It's always challenging to listen, but much appreciated. So happy to take questions, either audio or chat or whatever is your best coming back. Thanks, John. Questions for Dr. Sarah? Yeah, I have a question. Let's go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Hey, John. Uh, thanks for that hey. nice presentation. Uh, so uh, I know that uh, there are at least like a couple of years right now, there have been problems with foreign uh, postdocs 
like especially from China and stuff like that. So is it uh, some glitch in the system or is it uh, policy now? Yeah, no, so, so, so good question. And I would say the best news is, I think rumor is running ahead of reality. So, you know, as, as you'll recall from when you were with us, uh, you know, we have of order 500 postdocs now. It is still the case that the majority of them are not U.S. citizens. So our postdoc population looks just like the U.S. research community, which is very diverse and very non-U.S. Uh, there have been some particular hurdles over the last year or so, I would say, especially with individuals from China um, to a lesser extent with Russia. Um, I think we're working through that pretty constructively. So we are absolutely open to citizens of all countries um, with a few very minor exceptions. And every case we work, we work an individual benefit risk case. So have we said no to, for example, some candidate Chinese postdocs? The honest answer is yes, but it really is a quite small number. And in almost every case, we can get to yes. You know, we're, we're not going to have four nationals doing the sort of, you know, having having the source code for a nuclear weapons design code. Um, but there's tons of important work that non-U.S. citizens can do. And I think we're in a pretty good, healthy space overall. Yeah, as, as you can imagine that uh, I know the cases where it was uh, not weapons program and uh, people yeah. were denied this, uh, the internal security wouldn't allow them on site, uh, although they got yeah. all the clearance. All right, so, yeah, so that, that, the first question, I have another one also. Uh, so yep. you said that you are hiring about uh, 1,700 people, right, a year. Right. So how many, how many scientists out of them? Um, so the, 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 take the 1,200 number, um, I would say probably 200 to three of them are, are, you know, sort of scientists like you and I would recognize as sort of colleagues in the system alike. Another couple hundred are a combination of technologists, manufacturing experts. So it depends, you know, what your filter is, but somewhere between a quarter and a half, depending on how narrow your definition of science is, is science centric. So it's not it's not the whole thing. It's not 100 percent, but it's a good like fraction. Um, you know, you'll you'll recall from your past life. You know, one of one of the benefits of a growing laboratory is. LDRD is a tax on the core budget. So the bigger the lab gets, the bigger LDRD gets. And that's a very fruitful place for a very fundamental lesson. Yeah, I also, I also know that the bigger overhead gets, right? Yes, exactly. So we're, we're, so, we're working on that as well. And in fact, this, 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 so you're absolutely fair to say we are, we are an expensive place to work. And that's why it's important to have a sense of what the value proposition is, because we're not going to be the cheapest provider. Um, it is the case, actually, this year, we lowered our tax rates so they're incre it's incrementally more affordable for a PI to get work done, but we still have a lot of work to do to get where we need to be in that space. That's completely fair. All right, thank you. And it yep. was very, very nice to see you. Thanks. Good to see you as well. Uh, let's see, there's a question about postdocs and permanent residents. The answer is absolutely yes, um, including not not even permanent residents, but you know, but people who are just citizens of other countries. Um, you know, as we noted, there is some additional bureaucracy and paperwork we have to get work through, and there are some cases where we can't get to yes, but we're committed to having a laboratory as diverse as the broader research community, because that's the only way to get to smart people. Um, that was another version of the postdocs and the national students, so yes, absolutely. Um, um, so, yeah, so so is there a need for experimental material scientists? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, being one myself, um, you know, I think one of we, I'd say we as a laboratory are very focused on the balance of experiment and simulation in general, because you know we're we're learning amazing things from computation and simulation, but without actual data, without actual validation, um, your codes can easily fool you. So so definitely an interest in experimentals writ large, and I say for myself, I'm particularly nervous in our current so. You know, for people like me who go to meetings, for those of you who do simulations and calculations, work from home is a pretty practical thing. It's inconvenient to have your laptop in your bedroom, but you can get your job done. If you do hands-on experimental work, that's not something you can be doing from home. So we're working pretty hard to make sure we don't put an inadvertent bias against hands-on experimental work as we work through the pandemic. And the people we're allowing on site are biased in that direction exactly because that's important. 
Um, are there ways to continue research through the laboratory and DOE? So I'd say the answer is yes. Um, the partnerships and program, the pipeline partnership office, this, the sled of slides here is a good place to start. Um, there is a woman named Emily Robinson and Marion Woods at the, at the top, both of who be great contacts, and I'd be happy to point you in the right direction as well. But there are a number of things where you can either continue the funding you have and use that funding to do work at the laboratory or in some sense translate those activities into other things. And equally, if you don't have an existing relationship with DOE, uh, we're still happy to hire you as well. But lots of specific opportunities, Sophia, and we can, I'd be happy to pursue that offline. I think I got all of them in the chat. John, I, I had a question. Uh, sure. Uh, you know, the, 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 the centers uh, at uh, Lanel, those are very attractive for many faculties at Texas a and and other universities. And one of the ways to uh, use those facilities is to have some joint collaboration, you know, or uh, um, projects. Is there any way to access uh, those, those facilities as users, like, you know, one would pay an user fee and, you know, somebody needs a e-beam lithography or something and they go and use it. Do you, have an, do you need to have an established relationship with a researcher at LANL to be able to use those? Um, yeah, so good question. So, 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 and several entry points there, I would say. So one, um, we like essentially all of the DOE laboratories host national user facilities. So for example, we are the host of CENT, the Center for Integrated Net Technologies, and also the host of LANS. Um, you can use those facilities just by writing the user proposal. So if you, if you compete and win a user proposal, you can come work for us and you can come work for us for free. So we, won't, we can't pay you for your travel, but there's no sort of using the equipment cost, all that's entirely free. And you, while you're welcome to collaborate with our instrument scientists, that's not required. You can just say, I went into this measurement, it's an important thing. If it reviews well, then we will help support you in doing that independent of collaboration. Um, that's also true at Lance and to the earlier part of the discussion, that's true across all of the nanoscale science research centers, all of the light sources that exist at SLAC, Berkeley, Argonne, um, and Brookhaven. Um, and it's also true of the neutron scattering centers that exist at SH, for example. So big opportunity there. Um, in addition, in terms of working with individual scientists and engineers who might have their own particular tools, I'd say many folks are open to collaboration. Um, it's not always part of their day job, so they may want to have some more collaborative partnership, um, but certainly happy to help make connections and create those kinds of matches. And, and you know, in addition to the I forget the particular names of the collaborative mechanisms we have between a and and us. The sort of the, the, the tier one ones, which are the more entry level short visit kinds of things are a great route for doing that. Thanks. Um, let's see, roles, non-science context. Um, so science communication and policy. Um, so I'd say yes, absolutely. Um, uh, the, the, I'll go back for a second. Um, the, this Joint Center for Resilient National Security at the bottom of this slide, which is overtly a LANL Texas A&M thing, is actually part of the broader auspices of what we call the National Security and International Studies Center, uh, which is focused on a set of broadly defined national security policy things. So certainly opportunities in that space. Um, and then yes, absolutely, um, you know, we. You know, part of the reason we're sort of the best untold story going is we don't tell our story very well. Um, so we have a growing communications organization trying to balance both the sort of how do we articulate what we do well, including just the overt function of public affairs. So, so not probably as many opportunities there as for physicists at large, um, but certainly opportunities exist and more than happy to help you make connections. Um, to what degree do scientists have freedom to choose their own projects? Um, I would say, I think that, that kind of depends on what you want to do. And so if you want to operate, relatively speaking, as an individual investigator, um, and with us, you want to work to attract funding 
either from external sponsors or from this laboratory directed research and development program, LBRD, um, that certainly is possible. Um, and some of our folks work as single investigators all by themselves their entire career. Um, as we talked about earlier, that, that can be a relatively tough existence. Um, I think most of our folks prefer to work on small teams or big teams. And within those teams, there's both some flexibility and part of being on a team is also working with others. Um, and in the other extreme, you know, some of our programs are sufficiently large and certainly longstanding that your only responsibility is to do good work, not to engage in sort of the, the funding attraction part of having your own freedom. So I, I think there's a fair degree of flexibility across the continuum of, let's call it personal academic um, choice of area freedom um, across the board. And I think people, people find ways to do that. You know, one of the things, most people laboratory, they don't do one thing their whole career. They, they do a variety of things. So they're, they're a physicist, but for part of their life, they contribute to our high energy physics, very open science part. Other part of their life, they work in the weapons program. A third part, they work on some global security challenge. That kind of moving around and reinventing yourself, I think is one of the strengths that the labs in general, and I say we almost almost in particular, um, are important to us. Well, it looks like a lot of good questions and a lot of good answers. Uh, any other questions? If not, let's thank John for an excellent talk and looking forward to many opportunities for our students, postdocs, and other researchers. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, thank, no, thank you all for having me. appreciate your interest. Look forward to doing this live in, you know, in College Station sometime because it's that much easier to sort of form relationships and discuss. But, but again, more than happy to follow up offline. So my email is on the bottom of the screen. Um, don't hesitate to reach out, try to get back to you, make connections and stuff like that. Because we really want to foster the kinds of partnerships that we're already succeeding on in the first two years, but have lots more upside potential as well. Thanks everyone.